shortly after learning about sets, you probably learned about subsets. Similarly, now that we've talked about groups, today we'll go over subgroups. We'll see some examples and non-examples of subgroups. We'll of course take a close look at the definition, which is a little bit more interesting than you might think. Then we'll prove a really important but simple result about subgroups, and we'll finish off with a quick example of proving a particular set is a subgroup. All right, let's get into it. Let's begin by considering this group, the additive integers, and a few subsets from this group. We'll look at each of these subsets and discuss some properties that they may or may not have. First, consider this set S. This is a subset of the integers containing the integers negative 3 through positive 3. Now we might say that this set S is closed with respect to inverses because since we're talking about addition, the inverse of 3, for example, is negative 3, the inverse of 2 is negative 2, the inverse of negative 1 is positive 1. So we would say that S is closed with respect to inverses because if an element is in S, so is its inverse. However, S is not closed with respect to the actual operation. The operation is addition, and S is not closed with respect to addition because, for example, if we take 3 and 2, 3 plus 2 is 5, which is not in S. So S is closed with respect to inverses, but it's not actually closed under the operation of addition. Meanwhile, the set of positive integers, which is, of course, also a subset of the integers, this has the opposite problem. It's not closed with respect to inverses. The inverse of 1 is not in the set, neither is the inverse of 2, or in fact the inverse of anything. However, it is closed with respect to addition. If you take any two positive integers and add them, you will get another positive integer. So, this set is closed with respect to addition, but not with respect to additive inverses. And the fact that this set is closed under addition would be false if we removed a single element from it. For example, if we removed the element 2, well now 1 plus 1 is not in the set. So clearly, if we take a subset of a group, it might be closed with respect to inverses, it might be closed under the actual operation, but it could have neither of these properties. It could have just one of these properties. Another possibility is that it has both of these properties. H is also a subset of the integers. H is the set of even integers. H is closed with respect to inverses, since the inverse of any even integer is also an even integer. The inverse of 4, for example, is negative 4. Also, this set is closed under addition. If you add any two even integers, you get another even integer. And this is the definition of subgroup. Here is the definition written with multiplication words. We've been talking about addition. We're mostly going to talk in terms of multiplication for the rest of the lesson. So the definition of a subgroup in terms of multiplication. Let G be a group and H a subset of G be non-empty. So H is non-empty. If H is closed with respect to inverses, so it has all the inverses, and multiplication, so if you compose any two elements in H, you get another element in H, then we say that H is a subgroup of G, and we write that like this. This notation for subgroup is not universal, but it does seem to be the most common subgroup notation. So notice in this definition, we don't actually require that H be a group in order to be a subgroup. We don't require that the operation on H is associative, and we don't require that H has an identity, although, as we'll prove, it does actually inherit these properties from the group that it comes from. So subgroups are, in fact, groups. But we don't have to explicitly require all those group properties in the definition. Again, back in the three examples we looked at, H is the only subset of the additive integers that had these properties of being closed with relation to inverses and closed under the operation, which in this case was addition. So H is the only subgroup that we've seen thus far. So let's look at a few more examples of subgroups, but let's first pay attention to this note. If we say that H is a subgroup of G, 
H is inheriting the operation from G. So the operation of H is the same as in G, which means if you compose two elements in the subgroup H, you'll get the same thing as if you had composed them in G because they have the same operation. It doesn't mean anything to say H is a subgroup of G if we just let H have whatever operation it wants instead of requiring it to have G's operation. A subgroup of G has to have the same operation as G. With that said, here are a few examples. This asterisk in the superscript of the rationals denotes the positive rationals. Similarly, this denotes the positive reals. So the multiplicative group of positive rationals is a subgroup of the multiplicative group of positive reals. If you take any positive rational number, its inverse is also a positive rational number. The inverse of three-fourths, for example, is four-thirds, another positive rational number. Also, the positive rationals are closed with respect to multiplication. If you multiply two rationals, you get another rational, and they're all positive. So indeed, this is a subgroup of this. Another less interesting example is the group G itself. If you take any group G, it is by definition a subgroup of itself because if it's a group, well, it must have all its inverses and it's certainly closed under the operation. So any group is a subgroup of itself. It is also the case that if you take just the identity element from a group, you get a subgroup. These two examples, the group itself and just the identity, are called the trivial subgroups. Anything other than this is a non-trivial subgroup. The set containing 1, minus 1, i, and minus i is also a subgroup of the multiplicative positive complex numbers. 1 is its own inverse, negative 1 is its own inverse, and i and negative i are inverses of each other, since i times negative i is equal to negative negative 1, which is 1, which is under multiplication, the identity. So this set is closed with respect to inverses, and indeed, if you multiply any two of these numbers together, you get something that is in the set. One more example of a subgroup, the set containing zero and two is a subgroup of the additive integers mod four. The inverse of zero is itself, the inverse of two is itself, and two plus zero is in the set. So indeed, it's a subgroup. Notice in these last two examples, I didn't specify what the operation of the subgroup was. As it is implied, it's the operation from the containing group, which is sometimes called the overgroup. So again, if we have a non-empty subset of a group called H, H is a subgroup if it's closed with respect to inverses and multiplication. We could, of course, speak about this in terms of addition, but it's the same idea. Again, the definition doesn't explicitly require that H itself be a group to be a subgroup. However, these restrictions are, in fact, enough to force H to be a group, which is what we will now prove. If H is a subgroup of G, then H is a group. And I've basically just outlined the proof here. Since H is a subgroup of G, H is non-empty. So we can take three elements, A, B, C, from H. They might be distinct, they might not be, but for sure, H has at least one element. Now, we know that H must have closure. AB must be an element of H by definition of subgroup. A subgroup is required to be closed under the operation. So if we take two elements A and B from our subgroup, then their composition or their product will also be in H. Similarly, by definition of subgroup, if we take an arbitrary element A, its inverse will have to be in the subgroup. Again, that is explicitly required by the definition of subgroup. So to prove that H is a group, all that remains is to prove associativity and the existence of an identity. Associativity is pretty easy. If we've got these three elements, A, B, and C, A times B, C has to be equal to A, B times C, because A, B, and C are elements of the group G. And by definition, the group is associative. And again, H inherits the operation from G. So we're still talking about the same exact operation. We're talking about the same exact products. These are coming from a group. So the operation on these elements still has to be associative. 
and the existence of an identity comes from closure and the existence of inverses. We know that there's some element A in H, but by the closure of inverses, that means that the inverse of A is in H. But then, by the closure of the operation, if we combine A and A inverse, what we get, which is by definition the identity, must be an element of H. I'll run you through that one more time. There has to be an element in H, by definition, subgroups are non-empty. And also by definition, subgroups contain their inverses. So, the inverse of A is in H. Also, subgroups are closed under the operation, so if we combine A with its inverse, what we get must also be in the subgroup. And what we get, by definition of an inverse, is the identity element. So indeed, if H is a subgroup of G, H is a group. And this is one of the uses of the definition of subgroup. If you have a set of objects and some operation coming from some bigger thing that you already know is a group, then to prove that the smaller thing is a group, you only need to prove it's a subgroup, which means you only need to prove that it has closure and inverses. So that's pretty nice. Let's move on to our final example where we'll prove that a particular subset is a subgroup. All right, so we're thinking about this group G, the additive real numbers, and we want to show that this subset of G containing the logs of positive rationals is a subgroup of G. Let's note that, of course, there do exist positive rational numbers whose logarithms are defined, so H is not empty, and the logarithm of a positive rational number is a real number. So for sure, H is a non-empty subset of G. So to prove that H is a subgroup of G, we just need to prove that H is closed under addition, and we need to prove that H is closed with respect to inverses. So anything in H also has an inverse in H. To do this, we'll begin by taking two arbitrary elements from H. The elements from H are logarithms, so we can express them like this, log A and log B, just two arbitrary elements from H. To show that we have closure, let's combine log A and log B. So we have log A plus log B. But by our familiar log rules, this is equal to log of A times B. A and B are both rational numbers. They are positive rational numbers, in fact. And the product of positive rational numbers, you may have proven this before in the past, is also a positive rational number, which means that this must, in fact, be an element of H. One more time, log A plus log B, by our log rules, is log A times B. The product of two positive rationals, though, is also a positive rational. Thus, by definition, log AB is an element of H, which means log A plus log B is an element of H. So indeed, H is closed under addition. Next, we'll show that H has inverses. So if we take an arbitrary element, log A of H, we want to show that its inverse is also in H. The first thing that we'll do is point out that the inverse of log A is negative log A, since negative log A plus log A equals log A plus negative log A, which are both equal to the identity of zero. So we know what our inverse is. It's negative log A. We just have to prove that negative log A is an element of H. We do that by, again, using our log rules. Negative log A is equal to log of A inverse, and then A inverse is itself a positive rational number. So we know that this inverse is an element of H. And again, we know that A inverse is a positive rational because A is a positive rational. So we might say that A is equal to P over Q, but then we know that A inverse is equal to Q over P, and Q over P would have to be a positive rational also since P over Q is. So by definition, that will have to be in H. The logarithm of any positive rational number is in H. H. So H is closed under addition, it's closed with respect to inverses, and so we have proven that H is a subgroup of G, which also means that H is a group. 
Interestingly, you might notice that this whole proof really just boiled down to the multiplicative positive rationals being a subgroup of the multiplicative positive reals because we turned the addition of logs into really a multiplication of positive rationals that really became our focus. And then we turned the inverse of a logarithm into a multiplicative inverse of a positive rational interesting. Anyways, that's all I've got for you today. Again, we say that a subset, a non-empty subset of a group G is a subgroup if it's closed with respect to inverses and multiplication. And we write it like this using the less than or equal symbol. Hope that was helpful. Let me know in the comments if you've got any questions or video requests.